Hey there, scary story fanatics. Welcome back to Cleaving Thought from Bone with your host, Sociopathic. Fan of open water, not afraid of what just may be lurking in the deep? Well, you may want to rethink your inhibited trepidations because tonight's story will drag you down into the fathoms. So, lock your doors and think about moving to Kansas. I call tonight's ghostly tale, Abandoned Ships. The ocean is a vast, dark, enveloping, and mysterious thing. It is both broad and deep, and the deepest of those waters, where fathoms are nearly unfathomable, resides many seaside secrets that none of us will ever know. The ocean hides its secrets well and only rarely reveals one here and there. Remember the myths of the Kraken? The existence of the giant squid? I can recall being a child, and scientists and skeptics alike regarding the notion of such a creature to be absolutely absurd. Well, although a specimen of Kraken proportions has yet to be found, yet being a key word here, the giant squid was of course discovered officially by a team of Japanese researchers in 2004. And let's not forget the Coelacanth, another shining example of what may yet still be concealed by a substance that covers more than three quarters of our planet's surface. This long believed extinct deep sea fish was rediscovered by a 32-year-old Majori Courtenay Latimer in 1938. Literally, up until that point, everyone regarded the chances of such a creature still existing were not all that dissimilar from the idea of a living, breathing T-Rex. Well, these things are just the secrets uncovered by us, allowed to be shared with us by our beloved sea. But what of those instances where no explanation exists, where the ocean's depths have refused to give up their secrets? And by instances, I mean mysterious events such as ships simply disappearing, strange lights deep below the surface on clear, dark nights and the discovery of perfectly functional, abandoned vessels showing no outward signals of distress or reason for being absconded by captain and crew. Well, usually, those with rational minds, full of logic and reason, are happy to surmise the most mundane and grounded assumptions. But what if some of these instances are simply due to reasons born of things grotesque and malicious that just haven't been discovered or at least acknowledged yet. I will tell you, any who would listen and not think me mad, that accounts of such dire events have been recorded, acknowledged and subsequently hidden by parties high up or even outside the government hierarchy. Well, that's why I haven't shared this one with anyone and have hidden my discovery. But I can't sit on the information any longer. Welcoming ears deserve to hear and have the chance to heed this tale. I used to be a member of the U.S. Coast Guard. I'm not anymore, and no, I didn't quit. But I wanted to, dishonorable discharge or not. 
Even now, the thought of the open ocean disturbs me, and I would never want to go back. Not after the day we received a transmission informing us to respond to an adrift fishing vessel about 30 miles off the coast of Seattle. Even as I approached the stern from a distance off, I could tell that there was something identifiably wrong, and I distinctly recall shivers running up the length of my spine. But these are cold waters after all, and a misty breeze off the North Pacific is enough to shiver even the hardiest of men. I was one of six members to board the small dinghy and make way towards the Elizabeth Marie, a small fishing vessel that I will never forget. The deck and ballasts ached and groaned as the ship heaved lazily from side to side. A cold chill seemed to hang in the air and cling to my skin beneath my uniform like slimy ice. But besides that, there was nothing out of place, and I mean absolutely nothing. Upon a search of the galley, the scene revealed whole meals left cold on plates, beverages nearly full in their glasses. It appeared as if the crew had simply got up at the start of their dinners and walked away, only to jump into the cold, unforgiving sea, leaving no trace of their location or hints to their circumstances. I had the honor of searching the captain's quarters alone, and as anxious as I was, as foreboding as this place felt, this wasn't an honor I enjoyed. I saw it as soon as I pushed the door open, sitting dead center on a small desk atop a light brown, leather-bound journal. Of course, I wanted to read the journal and know its secrets, but it was the small object, fashioned from what looked like coral, that caught my immediate focus. I had seen this before, on other ships found adrift like this one and I knew that if I reported it, turned over this possible evidence, it would once again be deemed classified, and even speaking of it again would be punishable by my superiors. This is highly unethical, I know, going against everything they teach you in training and against every single regulation, but I placed both the journal and the object deep into my pockets for later personal perusal. By the time I had a chance to look through the old leather-bound confession, or the odd trinket I had confiscated, I was long secure within the confines of my own cabin aboard my own ship with the rest of my crewmates. Now, granted, unless you're an officer, you don't get the pleasure of personally assigned quarters, so I had bunkmates shifting around as I read. Luckily, no one seemed to pay me any more mind than if I was simply reading a novel for entertainment. Unfettered and unobstructed, I began exploring the contents of those pages, searching for a correlation between it and the thing I found lying with it. It wasn't long, towards the end of the journal, that I had found what I was looking for. Eager with the enticement of curiosity, I began to read silently to myself. September 16th, 2017 Today was a great day out at sea. The kids really seemed to be having more fun today than yesterday. Kara caught a good-sized blackfish after lunch, and Derek finally landed himself a sea bass like he wanted. Granted, it wasn't too big in comparison to one that's grown to full length, but it doesn't take the biggest fish in the ocean to make a young boy happy. Of course, Aaron, my beautiful wife, if you should ever read this, 
spent the majority of her day today slathered in sun lotion and bathing in the hot summer heat. She always did prefer the heat, while my only complaint is that the shade is in more than short supply out here. I think I've got everyone convinced to stick it out one more night before we head in. It really is peaceful out here. Later that evening. The children are watching a DVD in their books, and Aaron is cleaning up from dinner, so I'm using this isolated moment to record this peculiar object pulled from the belly of Kara's second blackfish. The child was struggling with her pull, and it was a pretty big fish, so I was happy to step in and lend a hand. The first thing I noticed when I took control of that sturdy deep-sea pull is that whatever was on the end of the line felt like more like a dead weight than a fish, as if I was hauling up a large chunk of driftwood. I could feel the flick of the occasional twitch of a fin or a head, but it was slight, nearly undetectable. So I wrestled the reel into submission anyway and used brute strength to get this thing to the surface to be netted. Once there, I could tell that it was indeed a fish, a big one as I've already said. Using a large net to help get it over the side, the large, black and brown, glistening beast slipped over the top and spilled onto the deck, causing Kara to run, screaming to her mother that she had caught an even bigger fish this time, leaving me alone to wrangle the creature and remove the hook from its mouth. When I bent over to do just that, I noticed an object protruding from its belly, causing a small amount of blood to ooze from the wound and mix with the seawater that saturated the fish and the deck of my boat. It appeared as though this creature of the deep was impaled through the underside by a long stick, which would account for the thing's sluggish movements as it was being reeled to the surface. Curiously, I grabbed a hold of the distal end of the object and pulled it firmly, sliding it free. Once fully removed, I could clearly see that the other end that was once buried deep within the anatomy of the blackfish was wider, hooked back, and then pointed at the end, almost triangular, like a barbed arrow. My mind still hadn't made any connections yet, but I knew something was wrong. I made sure to unhook the fish and stuff the object into my vest pocket before my wife and child returned. Kara was young, and Aaron is more than anxious at being out here as it is. It's only now that I can examine this thing under a strong light, which has brought me to a few, if true, terrible conclusions. The thing was surely a fashioned weapon. The thing is surely a fashioned weapon made of coral, and it resembles a crude short spear or long arrow. The majority of it was shoved deep inside the fish, so whatever impaled the creature must have done so with incredible force. But the most disturbing thing about the whole event is that the wound was fresh, so whatever injured the blackfish had done so within a matter of minutes before I brought it over the side of the boat. We're miles from shore, and I haven't seen so much as another vessel for days. There are certainly no divers nearby, and even if there were, why would they have done this with a sculpted shard of coral reef? Whatever did this is still out there, underneath the rippling waves. My only fear is... The entry ended abruptly here, only to continue on further down the page. I later learned, as will you, that this is because the author had apparently hastily left his writing in order to attend to some urgency. Sometime in the night, between September 16th and September 17th, 2017. They're gone. Kara, Derek, and Aaron. I was only a few feet from them. 
This vessel isn't that big. I heard the children scream first, then Aaron after. The children shrieked out in fearful cries. Aaron's was panicked. I've heard that scream before, when we thought we lost Kara when she was little, and that she had wandered into the pool. She obviously didn't. We found her out back, walking the tree line, actually. But I'll never forget that scream. And this was nearly identical to that. The type of shrill cry that sends shivers up your spine and your muscles tense even at the thought. I opened the cabin door, only to be greeted with the sound of something splashing in the water off the starboard. I leaned over the edge and I saw nothing. Nothing but the black, bottomless waters of the Pacific Ocean. The thought that my family had somehow been dragged down into those icy depths is more than I can bear. I did search the rest of the ship for them, but like I've already recorded, this vessel isn't all that big. But I saw something else when I returned up to the deck for another look, something I had overlooked, either in haste or the angle of the light, but somehow... I missed a series of large, wet spots on the deck, leading to the side before ending abruptly. But they weren't footprints. They were more like claw prints with long, pointed digits, and each was wide, nearly as triangular in shape as the spearhead I described earlier. I followed their lead and stared off the side and out into the open sea. Nothing but the black sky and water with shining little diamond studs above me. I called out their names until my throat went hoarse. My mind keeps reeling for an explanation, but each and every attempt at logic brings me right back to the illogical conclusion. There's no way it or they came from the sea. Tales of vicious merpeople are nothing but a myth spread by the tongues of drunken fishermen. But it's the only conclusion I can reason is plausible, if plausible at all. I tried radioing for help, but nothing but static on each and every notch on the dial. It's as if something is jamming my signal, or that the whole world beyond this ocean has simply disappeared. I'm more inclined to believe the former, but explanation again eludes me. I'm going to head in. I don't care to wait for the light of day. Maybe I can get help out here and search for my missing loved ones. But even if I do, I expect it to be an experiment in futility. I just don't. This may be my last words on Earth. There's something walking across the deck, just outside the cabin door. I hope, pray that it's my wife or one of my children. But their heavy footsteps, staggered and coincide with a wet slap of flesh against the wood boards. I'm going to check, but if these are truly my last words, then I have met with the fate I both fear and now. Or see. These were the final words written in the journal. Nothing but blank pages thereafter. After reading this confession, my desires to leave the Coast Guard and never set sail again were reaffirmed. This is not the only account of this type to surface. In fact, just do a general internet search for mermaid spears found buried deep in a fisherman's catch. And you'll find more documented evidence than I can provide. And this isn't the only abandoned ship the Coast Guard, or even my division, has come across. Of course, not all of these accounts can be directly related with malicious intent from residents of the deep. But these artifacts 
and fully functional, completely abandoned ships are uncovered all the time. Makes you wonder, how related are these incidents? Well, I've seen enough that I'll never go near the ocean again, and if you're smart, and heed my warning, neither would you. So, to escape the murk, avoid the water. I hear Illinois is nice this time of year, and I do like corn. But if you're hungry for more fear, stop by again next weekend for a fill-up. And until then, make sure to like, share, subscribe, and turn on notifications so I can catch you all again next Saturday. <laughs> <laughs>